So I'm going to start with a quick presentation, uh, and then um, I'll show you a demo of what you can do in machine learning space with Kubernetes. Uh, and my demo will be a full end-to-end -end life cycle. So let's start with that. Um, I, I think I got already introduced by Steven. I'm uh, Faisal, I'm a principal architect and machine learning lead in Red Hat APAC. I'm author of a book called Kubernetes Workshop. Um, I talk to uh, lots of public engagements in Intel AI Summit and API days. And I contribute to OSS a lot. So recent one was I contributed to Key Clock Operator. All right, so let's start with the machine learning. and um, Whenever you start talking about machine learning, right? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? And the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is, hey, I want to build that, that cool person who's going to build the model and who's going to tune it up, right? That's what we, when we think about machine learning has is so cool at the moment, uh, and everybody want to be part of it because everybody thinks they want to do model building and tuning, right? But as per the Google paper, if you see the paper is in the bottom, it's called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning, is uh, most of us want to focus on the coolest part, which is model building and tuning. However, the overall machine learning ecosystem in the model building is only a, a part of it and a small part of it. The bigger challenge is, uh, is on the left-hand side, you can see in the blue color box are data. And data collection, data verification, uh, feature extraction, configuration of data, accessibility of that data, that's a huge challenge. And that's one of the reasons, as per uh, the recent Gartner study, that 80% of the machine learning initiatives are failed to deliver value. You may have a good, nice working model with your test data on your laptop, but when you go to the real world, it's failed to deliver the value. And that's because the focus is only on the red bit instead of the overall ecosystem. And on the right hand, you, right -hand side, you can see uh, the tools that actually makes uh, the model uh, relevant. You know, if you are building the model and deploying a model six months late, maybe somebody else already has your business. So you need to have good serving in infrastructure. You have to have resource management. Uh, you have to have monitoring to make sure the model has been released and been used by real application, by real people in and at the appropriate time. So that's one of the challenge, uh, what are we face in machine learning, this, uh, what I call problem number one. And if you go a little bit, this is a paper released by Google uh, scientists around two weeks ago. And you see that the title, uh, although uh, on, on the top there's my title called Data Beats Algorithm, but the, the, their title is everybody wants to do the model work, not the data work. And I put on a little bit extract at the bottom. You can see here uh, the scientists trained the model that was detecting uh, some of the medical conditions based on the pictures. But the, the model has been trained on high, uh, like uh, high spec images. The model has been trained on really good images. But when you use the model in real world, and in the real world, uh, like some hospitals maybe have a little small speck of dust on the images, the model was failed to detect the eye condition. So, so the problem again, um, everybody assume the test data, the data that they're testing with is the right uh, thing to do and they create the model against that. But in the real world, it's, it's changed. And because real world is always changing, you know, I give the example of, for example, uh, I, I think we all use Google Maps here for uh, public uh, transport. And the last year when and it, Google actually predicts how full your bus is and how full your tram is and how full your train is. But when last year, when because of COVID, uh, there's a sudden change of usability of those uh, public transport facilities, the model was not uh, recent enough. So it was still it was still predicting the bus will be less than seventy percent full and there will be like five people on the bus, right? So the to have a successful machine learning initiative, you have to keep the focus on data nowadays. Uh, and the model bit will come there easily. Now this, so that's the challenge number one is you have to focus everything, right? The challenge number two is uh, what I say is when I'm building a successful uh, a machine learning project that is going to create value for the business, that is not only data scientist job or not only data data engineer job, right? You need to have a domain expert. So let's imagine I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good, let's say I'm a good data scientist, right? I'm not a key core data scientist. I, I'm an ML architect, but let's say I'm a good data scientist. But if somebody gives me COVID data, 
you think I can interpret the data in the right way as as compared to a doctor or somebody from medical background? No, right? Because we need to have that right amount of knowledge to interpret the data, to find the gaps, to find the outliers in the, in the data. So we need domain experts. We need SMEs. So we need all kinds of people. And then we need app developer and IT operations all definitely fall for IT related stuff and making use of that data itself. So it's like a huge uh, group of people that why I say it takes a village. Um, and then whenever groups of people come in, there's always a challenge of collaboration. How do you collaborate across people? How do you make sure that everybody is doing in a way, in, in a manner that everybody's work on a single aim uh, to create value for the business? So that's the number uh, number two challenge, what I see in, in machine learning, right? So what I did here is I superimpose these two challenges as one. If you see in the in the in the middle where the blue boxes, this is a, these are technical challenges. You have to codify the um, the problem. You have to find the fitness function. Uh, you have to federate and clean the data, feature engineering, model tuning, model validation, deployment, and continuous monitoring. These are the technical challenges. And you can see I superimpose the roles. You need data scientists, you need product owners, you need data engineers, you need ML uh, engineers, and so on and so forth. So you can see here to build a, a, a good business or model that's delivering business value, you have to have a, this long kind of flow. And then you have to have the right people collaborating at the right effort, right? And that's where the challenge is. The challenge is if we want these, for example, data scientists, right? They are not IT uh, app, app developers. They they don't uh, know. They just uh, working on Python. They are mostly data statistics. You know, they can they can play with numbers. They can play with different visualization, but they're not app developers, right? Um, and then you allocate them uh, an instance, an EC2. Let's say you have a big EC2 instance, 64 cores and uh, 256 gigabyte of RAM, you share it across four data scientists um, and somebody can and can uh, bring that whole EC2 instance down, but uh, by overloading the memory or whatever, right? So we need to make a, a, a platform or solution in which all these people who are not IT from IT backgrounds, uh, from the basis is not IT backgrounds, they can work autonomously. How do we create little uh, kind of um, frameworks for them, we can little boundaries for them in which they can play and burn things, but they at the same time, they are autonomous. At the same time, they don't need to go to IT, hey, I need an easy access to EC2 instance, will you allocate it to me? So to, to, have a, to have a right set of speed in the team and to have a right uh, uh, people can work autonomously, we have to have a platform there where the people who doesn't come from the IT background, like data scientists, for example, they can work on their own. Same with data engineers, you know, for example, Spark is a very popular thing uh, at the moment and uh, sometime a Spark cluster get overloaded. There were different versions of Spark cluster then different version of PySpark and they need to go to IT to see, get, get me some time on a worker nodes and so on and so forth. So how do we enable data engineers so they can, they can provision the tools that is um, important to them to work autonomously and work from there? So that's also a challenge the platform uh, if it's solving. So we are enabling all these personas to work on their own uh, and handle the different challenges while keeping the overall um, ID governance uh, across them. Um, so if you see here on the bottom, we have a different kind of variety of infrastructure. Then we uh, run Cube on top of that. Um, and then there's a project called Open Data Hub, which I'll showcase you today which provides a set of tools which helps you do all these four uh, pillars that you see on the screen, right? So one on the left side, you have gather and prepare data, like process data, for example, Kafka and Spark. Um, then you can build machine learning model. You want to use uh, Jupyter Hub, you want to use PyTorch, TensorFlow, whatever. Uh, and similarly, when you build a model, how you do want to deploy that model, right? If I'm a data scientist, if I build a model, but because I'm not a programmer. So generally what happens, I need to involve app developer to expose that as an API. So that's a kind of a delay. So we want to enable data scientists so that as soon as they are done with the model, they can expose them as a REST API. So you, I'll show you how Seldon enable us to do that without any application knowledge. So data scientists can expose a REST API without understanding how to build a REST API. And then at the end, um, uh, there's a new trend that's been in, emerged in the last few months. It's called MLOps. That's to automate the training of the models. 
So once you deploy the model for the first time, um, if the data is drifting, you need to retrain the model using the same techniques, but you want to automate that. Otherwise, your data scientist will not be using his or her time um, uh, very efficiently, right? So these are the four components, and then all the four components merge together in a project called Open Data Hub. Um, your uh, I encourage you to go and see it's in the GitHub, um, and it what actually does it actually collects lots of good open source tools. Um, and give you a single point you can run in Kubernetes as an operator. Yeah, so um, I'll show you a demo uh, to how to build a customer churn um, model, which I'll start doing now. You it's, it's in my GitHub location. So it's, you, are, you can go there and download the whole code, the code with the helm charts and with Kubernetes and the machine, uh, notebooks and the cell done and everything and the pipelines, everything is in that location. You can run on its own. Um, uh, because I'm from Red Hat, so we have AIML residency offering uh, to our customers. So if your organization is is uh, looking to start the AIML journey or uh, want us to work with you to refine your existing AIML initiatives, uh, feel free to contact me on this um, email address. So let's start with the, uh, I'll just sh uh, quickly show you the GitHub location. So this is the Open Data Hub. Um, a GitHub location. Let me just go through quickly to my uh, GitHub. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so in the repositories, I'll just, this will give you an idea of uh, what I'm trying to say here. So this is the ML workshop I'm talking about. And if you see here, can you see the picture here? I'm just like, uh, zooming in. So this is an end-to-end -end, um, uh, kind of solution that I'll be showcasing you today. So we have uh, raw data available, let's say in Kafka and in S3. So uh, because uh, I'm showcasing everything as Kubernetes, so I installed MinIO on Q. So you have an S3 API running on Kubernetes itself. So we have, we have the raw data available and I'll show you the data. And then what I'll show you, I'll, I'll log in as a data engineer and then I'll use Spark to collect the data from two different sources and spit out as a single file. So now I'll show you how data engineers can be autonomous, how he doesn't need to talk to IT to get a Spark cluster, how he doesn't need to talk to IT to get an EC2 instance, and he or she can work uh, independently uh, with the freedom it requires to build a, his or her job, right? And then once you clean the data, it will store in the, in the MinIO. From there, we can log in as data scientists. Now data scientists has a totally different need. They need scikit maybe, or they need, I don't know, uh, TensorFlow, uh, they need some other kind of libraries, so we have uh, pre-approved libraries for them where they can use it. And I'll show you how to build the model, and then I'll show you a thing called water.ai. That's not part of ODH, but I use it as an again open source offering in which you can compare different models. I'll show you later. And then once a model is done, uh, there's a pipeline which I built in Jenkins that will take that model and use uh, Selden API to expose this model as a REST API. So at the end, you will be able to call your model via REST API. So that's an end-to-end -end, uh, thing that I'll be showing you today. So let's start with um, data engineer role. Um, so first of all is uh, when we go to Jupyter Hub, this is the Jupyter Hub hosted on Kubernetes. Uh, for my case, it hosts in OpenShift, which is enterprise Kubernetes. So first thing first is you need to sign with OpenShift, right? So sign means uh, it will take care of authenticate and authorization within your team. So let's say I sign in with OpenShift. Uh, it's asking me to log in. Uh, I'm gonna log in via Cube Admin. And just give me a second. I'll just uh, uh, log in with my user. I have to find a password, which I forgot to copy. Hold on. So to log in my user, I put my password in. So that's like for the authentication authorization, right? And what it does, it will it will log me in uh, to my OpenShift cluster. And if you can see here, it's giving me option. What is the option giving me is what kind of environment I want to use. If I want to do Spark, which has a Spark libraries, and these libraries can be pre-approved within your organization. So the governance and compliance will be taken care of from this from this perspective, right? Uh, you can have your own image, which I'll show you both. So I'll start with Spark. And then now this is for individual person. It's not like one EC2 instance is shared by six people, right? So every person will have his own little container uh, working within the resource and limits defined by the cube. 
and uh, you can see a, uh, the, the container size. I want to do default, small, medium, large, or just to medium. And you can have environment variable, whatever you want, right? And then you can start. So what it does, it will provision a, a Jupyter Notebook environment that is just configured for this user, the Cube Admin user, uh, using the Spark uh, libraries uh, that is pre-approved for your from your organization. Uh, and also, it will spin up a Spark cluster just for my user. So I don't need to share my Spark cluster by anybody else, right? So this is the same ML workshop, uh, GitHub repo. I already cloned it in this thing first. And the notebooks, I have a uh, first notebook called Merge Data. Okay, so now this is my this is my Merge Data. Let me show you how the data looks like. So now you guys can see my VS Code screen, the, the CSV files. Yes, now. You guys can see my CSV file now. Okay, I, I can't hear from anybody. Okay, anyway, so I'll start doing here. So you can see I have first file, which has few fields for customer ID, gender, senior citizen, and so on and so forth. And I have second file, which has more fields like uh, phone service, if the customer has a phone service, is multiple lines, internet service, different products that customer has got. So I'm uh, what I'm trying to show here, if the data is being distributed across two different files, and these two files are available in my S3 bucket, right? So I'll go to I'll go to my S3 bucket. You can see this is my S3, and you can see the raw data. Uh, it has two both the files available in my S3 bucket. So in my in my Spark thing, I'm not going to run it in this in the interest of uh, saving time. Uh, you can run it uh, using my GitHub location. And you can see here, I'm just importing some libraries. I use prefer to use Watermark. It tells you what libraries you are using. Then I connect to a Spark cluster, and you see the Spark cluster is the the IP address of the Spark cluster injected in this uh, in this notebook automatically because everybody has its own Spark cluster. <clears throat> and then uh, basically I started the Spark context. Then I read the file from the raw data bucket uh, P1, which has these fields: customer ID, gender, senior citizen, etc. Then I read the second file from S3, which has these fields: phone service, multiple lines, and all the products uh, and the churn, yes and no. Okay, and then what I'm doing here is I'm going, I'm creating a join between these two data frames, um, the customer information and uh, product information, and they are joined based on customer ID. And then I'm, I'm just writing the file to a, a new location called full data CSV. And I'm writing uh, only one file, you can see repartition into one, uh, and this file is available in, in my S3 bucket. So this is the this is the Spark notebook which you can run. It will automatically spin up your Spark cluster. It will uh, make sure that the right resources has been available to you. And this data engineer which is writing this particular Spark notebook has a little uh, enclave built for him or her to uh, to experiment, right? So this is a lots of enablement feature for data engineer to work fast. Uh, so once I uh, because I, I already pre-run it for for today. So if you see when I run it, uh, it it creates a file in my uh, S3 bucket. I'll show you in this data folder. So go to S3, I uh, have data, and you can see here that the user number is 29, and <clears throat> this is the file I've been generated. So you see, I've, the, I've generated this file today. It's uh, in, in the morning, like in the afternoon, and just to make sure we uh, we have the system available for us to work. So this file is showcasing you uh, the the data engineer part. And the data engineer can run and work um, on a Spark cluster and work with the files independently of anybody else. If the data is available, he or she can work and write the clean data into another S3 bucket, right? Which is uh, the data bucket. Now let's, uh, now this is a Spark user. Uh, now let's say I want to go uh, back to control panel. Uh, I say stop my server. Now I want to show you what we are going to do as uh, uh, a data scientist. So data scientist again will log in. He or she will use the file that has been pushed by data engineer and build and train the model, right? Uh, and I'll show you two things here in how to build and train the model and also how to use whatever I took to compare. So again, I'll start my server. Uh, let's say I'm a data scientist. I logged in and I say, okay, I, I don't want to use Spark. I want to use, uh, this is my custom notebook, uh, which is using Iliera instead of Jupyter, right? And again, I'm using container size of medium and I'll do start. 
what it will do, it will provision an environment for me. Uh, now I'm a data scientist where uh, all my libraries, uh, like uh, Scikit library and SNS and Matplotlib, everything is, is part of this my little environment. Uh, that will bring consistency also across uh, across the organization. So it will it is going to go and provision my um, my environment and then everything you know like everything is running on OpenShift so everything has been backed up. Uh, hopefully for, for, from Portworx you know if you're using Portworx or any of the tool that you are using. <clears throat> so let's start with a visualize model. So this is uh, this is the notebook that. I just try to mimic what data scientists do on day to day basis. You don't start to building data uh, data model, right? As you start, you actually uh, first visualize the data to see what's going on. So all these libraries I import, you can see I didn't do pip install. Most of them is already available in the in the data. Then what I do here is <clears throat> I connect to MinIO and I read the file that file that I mentioned before. Uh, 63C12, which is uh, in the MinIO, which has been pushed by the data engineer. I, I wrote, read the same file. And you can see here, I'm just putting, uh, reading using pandas, and I just to show the head, you know, so you can see the first five rows. You can see we have a uh, customer personal information like gender, senior citizen, part, and dependence, and then what uh, whatever kind of products these guys have. Do they have phone service? Do they have multiple lines? Do they have online security? And so on and so forth, right? And the last column, uh, sorry, and the last column in this uh, thing is called churn, if the customer has been churned or not based on this data. So what I'm doing here, uh, I load the database. As a data scientist, I'm just visualizing. I'm just trying to understand data so I can apply patterns and then apply thinking of what, what model to use, right? So you can do shape, you can do info, uh, you can do whatever. Yeah. So here is is very important thing that I that I show to everybody is called distribution of target values. So it means I want to make sure the data is distributed enough. Imagine if I have all the data with yes, churn equals to yes or churn equals to no, that there is not enough variation. So we need to make sure they have some good variation available. Um, so yeah. So this is basically a tool for data scientists to to visualize the data, uh, and they can work on their own and generate different visualizations. Um, Everything is running, of course, on, on Kubernetes, so they don't have to go to IT and the whole process is, is fast enough from there, right? So once you once you're happy with your data now, let's say uh, as a data scientist, you you say, okay, I'm happy with my data. I want to do some experiments. And that's what the, the fun part comes in. So this is my model experiments notebook. Sorry, this is my model experiments notebook right here. The same thing what we're doing here is <clears throat> We connect to S3, uh, we get the same file, uh, and then, but here what I'm doing is, I want to see what kind of model uh, will be useful for my data, right? So now what I'm doing here, I don't know if you guys are uh, coming from data science backgrounds, uh, we we apply different type of concepts to, before we uh, uh, use the data to, uh, to create uh, machine learning models. So here, for example, I, I'm showcasing you uh, when you're starting feature engineering. I'm using a thing called category encoder. So basically, you know, if you're from the gender, if gender is male or female. Uh, gender column has a value called male and female. So I want to convert into zero or one. So because uh, computers are better and machine learning models are better in managing numbers. So I want to convert gender male equals to zero or female equals to one or partner equals to yes to zero, partner equals to no to one, and so on and so forth, right? So that's, uh, we can do by order encoder. So <clears throat> what I'm doing here is, I'm creating an order encoder from here. And I just want to show you here, if you see the original data, gender has male, male, female, and then a string, right? And once I apply the ordinal encoder uh, here, the male and female becomes one and two. Right, so all these numbers that I, the fields that I want to apply order and encoder, it's going to convert, convert it into number from a string. Now, ordinal encoder is good for uh, values which has two or three different discrete values, but if you have tens or twenties or thirties, uh, then uh, the thing called one hot encoder, and I'm not going to go into detail of that, but we can apply a one hot encoder into that, right? So you can see all the fields are one zeros, right? There's no uh, string in, in my data set. After that, I, I, I split my data into train and test. Uh, you can see 20% um, testing and 80% training and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and then what I do, I try to do with decision tree classifier, right? This is a, this is a, this is a machine learning technique. 
or a model. So I want to apply decision tree classifier with my data. So I'm just applying uh, with hyperparameters, right? Um, and then because there can be different hyperparameters, you do uh, you find the best hyperparameter that works for you, and then you find out uh, these are the hyperparameter, right? So the important thing I want to show you here, and that's uh, that is uh, that is uh, one thing is once you design the hyperparameter. Um, Okay, then you use uh, decision tree classifier, and then when you when you are training your model with the with the hyperparameter that is has been spit out, you are storing the config the the metrics of the model in a thing called Vertado. I'll show you after that. So uh, just imagine I train my model by decision tree classifier, and I store the model outcome uh, in a, in a database. Similarly, as a data scientist, I say, okay, I'm going to try random forest also. Different different model types. Um, I'm just experimenting, whichever fits better for me. And similarly, here, what I did is once I apply the the model, I store the the metric in a database. Okay, so that's my experimental phase. And what I do after that, I log into uh, a thing called uh, Water Road AI. Hold on. Uh, You'll find it here. So this is my water.ai uh, interface. And then you see uh, my username is customer churn number 29. And remember, I run two models here. One is random forest classifier, and the other one is decision tree classifier, right? So when I go to Verta, you can see I have two experiments, number one and number two. And I can compare, right? So I can say, the decision tree classifier, it gave me accuracy of 79%. The random forest classifier, it gave me accuracy of 80%. Okay, and these are the parameters I've used in my decision tree classifier, hyperparameters. And these are the hyperparameters I've used in my uh, random forest classifier. So again, this product is also running an open shift. So this will assist uh, your data scientists to compare the result, to share whatever they are doing with other team members. There's nothing is running on the individual laptops. So don't go too much detail into machine learning here because this is uh, this talk is focused on Cube Cube, right? So with Cube, you can see that people are working autonomously, data scientists and data engineers, and data scientists can store and visualize what they are doing without need to worry about how to manage the Verta, where to install, what to install. Everything is pre-configured for them and everything is integrated within uh, their little environment. So this way they can they can record their learnings from their experiments and they can share their learnings uh, with other data scientists uh, using different tool sets that's been uh, enabled for them. Uh, and the last bit is uh, basically as a, as a data scientist, I'm gonna train my model. Now let's say based on what I decide to use decision tree classifier, because I say that the accuracy is similar, but decision tree classifier is less, um, it requires less CPU power, less resources. So I want to go decision tree classifier, just hypothetically, right? So I decide to use decision tree classifier. So what I will do here is again, I'll get the I'll get the CSV file, I'll run the thing, I'll train my model. So if you can see, I have a train train and save model function here uh, that will train my model. Now, the thing what I'm doing here is basically I am putting my models into a bucket. Okay, so whatever model this uh, this uh, has been generated with this run using decision tree classifier, I'm going to save is this model in the bucket uh, called models, and the file name is customer churn predictor or save. Okay, so that's my uh, model file that I, I'm I'm storing. So what after we run this uh, data scientists run this particular uh, notebook, uh, this model will be saved in um, the models. Um, uh, bucket and you can see this is one for today uh, uh, that I ran earlier this morning um, if you can see here these are the files created like so this is the model that we have created like a six kilobyte model uh, which I've created this morning so data scientist what is doing is you just call a couple of methods here that will store the model uh, into into an uh, s3 bucket right after that what will happen is um, we go to the the third bit of it we want to deploy this model and expose this as an API. Okay, so what you will do is, uh, I just want to show you one quick thing here. In the Jupyter uh, notebook here, um, we, we save the model in this particular uh, bucket called models. 
and you can see this is the this is the basic uh, the bucket name that we save our model to right so what as a deployment person what i'll do i'll go to deploy model this is jenkins right and just say deploy my model this is my name of my namespace where i'm doing all the work and this is the id uh, from where the model will be picked from my s3 bucket you can see this is the id i copied from here okay and then we can work with an institution organization somebody want to put a different structure here somebody want to put a kind of soft link kind of there but it's basically a unique way of uh, representing your models and then i say build that's it when i say build what it'll do it will start a pipeline that will take the model from s3 uh, introspect uh, the model parameters and expose the model as a rest api for you to consume okay that's a, that's a key thing here so uh, so this while this um, this pipeline has been executed i ran it this morning if you see here for may 11 around um, noon this uh, today so i ran this pipeline before so i'll just show you how, what happens after that so keep this point this is the this is your model key let's say 29 11 2021 this is uh, let's say your model key right so what this pipeline will do it will package your model as a container expose it as a rest api and deploy it on your openshift cluster or a kubernetes cluster right so let me show you here in uh, there's an ingresses so you can see the same name the same number that i mentioned before 29 11 2021 so this is the model has been deployed uh, by uh, by the pipeline uh, on this url okay uh, and then this model is basically exposed uh, over this url for you to consume so now i'll show you how to how to um, how to make a call to this model hopefully it's still working so hold on let me go to the postman quickly now this is the postman you can see here this is the same number the same url that uh, i mentioned there and uh, we are using a Selden, a, a tool called Selden, which actually take the model and expose it as the REST API. There's no magic behind it. And it actually exposed the model at this particular um, uh, endpoint. And you can see here, when I'm making a call uh, to my model, I'm giving him all the parameters uh, that you see here, right? Um, gender, senior citizen, partner, dependence, blah, blah, blah. The only thing that is not available here is churn, is now the model will predict if this guy will churn or not. So this is the outcome we are expecting from the model, right? So these are all the parameters we sent. Uh, and then we make a call to the model uh, as a REST API. Hopefully it's still working until this morning. Yeah, you can see here, it gave me the response. There is a 62 or 63% chance that this guy uh, will churn will be no. And there's a 37% chance that it will, he or she will churn. So this model giving a probability of churn or no churn. So you can see here is I allow uh, the model expose this as a REST API. I don't need to understand how the how to build an API. I don't need to understand how to package the API. The data scientist just click on that uh, on that um, Jenkins pipeline, and that will expose everything as a REST API, which can be used uh, by individuals. So here you can make a call to your model, and then uh, all the Cool features of Kubernetes like auto scaling, uh, monitoring, all these things comes um, as, as a part of it because it's a normal Kubernetes deployment. So that's kind of um, uh, that's kind of end to uh, to what what I'm I was trying to show you here. So maybe any questions you guys uh, you may have for me.